Are you able to break down a script in terms of when a script is submitted to you for you to consider? What are you looking at? How are you sort of dissecting it to see if it'll work? I try and read a script that's sent to me uh, as an audience first. Uh, so the first thing I'm looking at is, does it grab me? Do I care? Uh, is it a story that can, I feel emotional about, compelled by? You know, if it's a scary movie, am I scared? If it's a comedy, have I laughed? If it's emotional, have I, you know, gotten a lump in my throat? Um, I find that if I'm looking at it and dissecting it right from the start, I'm, uh, I'm not doing myself any favors and I'm not doing the script any favors. If I get to, I don't know, some point and it hasn't done any of those things, I usually don't finish it. Um, but if I get to the end and I have felt those things, then I'll go back and do a second read as with my producer hat on, which is, is this affordable? Can we do this? Will there be a part in it for a star? Which is, you know, things that, things that are too ensemble are difficult to get made because you need a star role to get things ordered usually. So, you know, I'm looking, I have, then I took my other hat on. And then, then the producer hat goes, okay, what, where would I shoot this? How much is it gonna cost? Is there a star role? Where would, was there a network or studio that would buy this? Because you don't want to obviously chase something that there's no place to sell. And so then that's the second read. What are some things in a script that sort of stick out as red flags, whether it's too many locations or even just the way the script is written? Too much space on the page, too little? Well, you can immediately tell when a script has not been written by a professional. And obviously that, that's a big red flag. So if the script has like art on the title page, or colored paper, or is not in final draft form. Um, you know, too much, too much of a header, or too much on the sides, and you know, okay, this person is either trying to get something to be shorter or longer by using the margins, which that's not playing fair. So, uh, so those are. But I would say red flags are things like, you know, not introducing your protagonist in the first ten pages, not you know, announcing what your film is, you know. In the first 15 pages, um, you know, don't don't wait until halfway through to tell me, oh, this movie's about this guy who wants to kill his mom. Okay, well, I'm not sitting here for an hour waiting for you to tell me that. So, um, uh, so I'm I'm looking for the the kind of structural and character problems um, that are pretty easy to spot. Um, you know, I'm not a big believer in the Robert McKee world of inciting incident and all of that, but there's value in what he has to say sort of philosophically, which is that there are some kind of foundational things you need to do in a screenplay that you, I don't, you know, unless you're doing experimental movies, which I'm not in that business. Uh, if you have a story to tell, there are certain, you know, parts of the roadmap you got to hit. and. Um, so if you know you hold back your protagonist until page thirty, and that's just not going to happen. There's no you're not acting a movie ask, asking a movie star to show up a half hour into the movie. So th those are the kinds of things I look for. When you say you read it as an audience member first, does that mean you're not even reading it? Let's say at your desk on a computer, you're trying to see it as in more of a reclining position, just more comfortable, or no? It just it, in your mindset. I. I'm sadly very old school. I'm the get off your lawn guy. So I <laughs> force my, uh, my development executive Gia to print everything. I don't like to read anything on my computer or on my iPad. I like to have the script in my hand. Uh, I like to have tangible. I want to be able to write things on it when, um, when I'm reading it. Uh, especially if I'm going to read it a second time as a producer, there's going to be things I'm going to note as I'm reading. And uh, so I, I like to have a, a finished script. So, and I'll read it on a plane, I'll read it bay, I'll read it on, out in the backyard. Um, I don't care where, where it is, but uh, I, I really like plain reading because nobody can bother me. I, do, I don't like to read a script in fits and starts. I prefer to just read it straight through. And it's hard to do that here in my office. I really can't. And it's not so easy at home either. There's a great, I mean, I find plane travel to be an, a luxury because there's no one calling me, nobody finding me, nobody tapping me on the shoulder, no emails, no nothing. So I do a lot of good reading on planes.
Oh, that's really interesting. Hopefully your your plane mate that's sitting next to you isn't, isn't looking to talk about sports or something. Yeah. <laughs> but that's it. I can on. There you go. The right. That's the do not <laughs> universal do not disturb sign. Exactly. But that, that I can relate to that. Or a book. It's it's a much different experience. I don't like to read a book on an iPad. My my right. wife has a Kindle. My son has a Kindle. I'm not a Kindle person. I like to have a book. Sure. There there's a different experience to yeah. holding that in your hand. And I'm sure even with paper as maybe non-recycling friendly. I, I'm I, I have the LA Times delivered to my house. I don't like to read the newspaper online. I'd much rather have you know I like flipping back and forth. I like having the access to if I'm reading the sports section to go back to the standings and find out what place the Dodgers are in when I'm reading the article on the Dodgers. If I'm doing that online, i got to click back and click back, and it's it's way less. I like the tangible feeling of moving through a paper. I, I, I would miss that. Well, it's similar to wanting to see a film with an audience. Oh, 100%. Instead of on your phone yes. or, or yes. a laptop, it's, yes. it's not the same. A hundred percent. Right. And the shared experience of watching a movie is completely unique. One of the things I love about uh, being a director is I get to experience the film more than I do as a producer. And as a television movie producer, it was the worst because we'd finish our movie, we'd turn it over to the network, it would go out and we'd have no sense of did people laugh where they were supposed to laugh? Did they cry where they were supposed to cry? Were they scared when they were supposed to get scared? I didn't get to experience any of that, but if I do a feature or an indie feature, um, I get to go into a theater and watch, oh, did it work? Did, did what I, you know, and then stand outside and, you know, when, when I did Perfect Sisters, and uh, it was a movie about two brilliant young uh, high school students who came up with the perfect crime to kill their alcoholic mother, who was a train wreck. Um, I my goal was to get you to the end of that film, and even after they committed this crime, to still be somewhat sympathetic to the two girls. And my favorite thing was to stand outside the theater and hear people argue with each other. They should have gone to prison. They shouldn't have gone to prison. Should have gone for longer. They shouldn't have gone for longer. That's what, I, that's what you want. You want them to walk out and be at odds with, with what the story you just told, as opposed to walking out and be bored or have no, no, no sense of um, outrage or anger or, or contentment or happiness. Or, you know, just to have to ennui is the worst thing you can ask from an audience. Do you ever fly to different cities and get out of sort of an industry-based town? If I can, I love to go to other cities um, and watch. But I, Again, I came from the television movie business, so of the 60 movies and series, I've only done three features. So most of what I got, I got from uh, relatives calling me going, hey, I saw your movie. Or when email came out, you know, friends and family, or when Facebook came out, hey, I saw your movie. But I don't get to get the visceral response, which I really miss. Um, I'll tell you, <laughs> I directed an episode of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. in season five, and uh, again, no, you know, goes out and I don't know. And it was Gia that told me that there's a whole YouTube channel where people watch something on television, but primarily series, and videotape themselves. It was fa fantastic. So now I've, I got to watch people watch my work. <laughs> it's great. I mean, as a TV movie producer, we never get that. We never get that. I mean, I would have screenings of all of my films before it aired on ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, TNT, whatever, MTV, whoever I was working for, I would screen it the week before for friends and family. Um, I would rent a theater and screen it because it was the only time I was ever going to see the audience reaction. I mean, I did, I did John Candy's last film, which he directed and starred in, called Hostage for a Day for Fox. Um, and that was a balls out comedy. I mean, it was, it was joke, 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 character comedy. And the only way I was going to know if people laughed where they were supposed to laugh was to have a screening and we had a big screening we had a big we rented a big theater and got a big audience and i got to see them laugh where they were supposed to laugh which hopefully john was there somewhere in spirit enjoying it as well